Thanks very much, Kevin. So uh, my name is Brian. I'm the uh, community advocate for Chainlink in Ireland. Um, and I'm going to start out with a sort of overview of Chainlink and what it is. And then Keenan is going to talk about on-chain verifiable randomness, um, which is a specific aspect of Chainlink um, that um, he'll get into in further detail. So I'll just give a, a primer. And I think the best way to explain Chainlink is in terms of the evolution of blockchain technology in general. Um, the first incarnation of blockchain was Bitcoin, um, as everyone knows by now. And a blockchain was just a, a block of uh, a sort of way of securing a ledger, which was a block of transactions that were connected together in a chain. Um, that's all a blockchain is. Each uh, node in the blockchain network would hold a complete copy of the ledger. Um, and each node would spend computational resources in verifying the state of the ledger. Um, thus, because the nodes are in theory independent and because they have to spend computational resources in, when they authenticate the ledger, uh, and also because they are, have an incentive to, um, to do so, it means that you can trust the ledger. The ledger is authenticated in a distributed fashion. So the takeaway here is that instead of needing to trust a single third party, like for example, you would your bank, um, you trust them to report your account balance and debits correctly. Um, now you didn't need to rely on one single uh, point of failure like that. Um, so that was the innovation of Bitcoin um, back in 2008. The next incarnation of blockchain was Ethereum. And Ethereum extended this idea to cover uh, not just units, not just uh, um, you know, uh, adding and subtracting units and sending um, Bitcoins around a network, but actually extending it to smart contracts. And smart contracts are just computer code that is deployed and executed on the blockchain. In the case of Ethereum, the blockchain is the Ethereum network. And the co what this enabled was basically for more complex types of relationship to exist on the chain. Um, parties could now write contracts into, formulate contracts in terms of computer code and um, basically enable that code to execute on the blockchain without a need for a trusted third party. Um, so basically, once uh, smart, contracts are smart contracts are formulated in a way that makes them self-executing so that they automatically execute once the predefined conditions for execution that are specified in the contract are fulfilled. So there's no need for an independent trusted third party to oversee the execution. An example of one of these contracts might be something like, once this amount of currency reaches this wallet address before this time, then this amount of tokens will be released to that address. So you'll note in that example that every step in this execution of this agreement happens on change, or on chain rather, on the Ethereum network. So that um, once it's triggered, nothing else needs to occur off chain. Think about a traditional type of contractual relationship where you're using a, a written document you, you might enter into an agreement, but there are many steps in the execution of that agreement before it's ultimately fulfilled and both parties have discharged their obligations. With a smart contract, it's all executed in one fell swoop once the conditions specified in the contract have been fulfilled. Um, so the, the thing about smart contracts is that you could suddenly have this computer code that would execute and fulfill the, the contracting parties agreement uh, all entirely on chain in a trustless fashion without the need for a independent third party overseeing it. Um, and so obviously this, this has really wide implications for all sorts of industries. Um, when you think about like the amount of different industries that are really just trusted third parties in disguise, um, then uh, you, you see what I mean, like lawyers, accountants, escrow agents, all these, uh, at least part of these jobs all involve just being a trusted third party. Suddenly you have this technology that basically 
um, makes that aspect of their job uh, redundant to some extent. So um, that was the big um, that was the big sort of innovation of Ethereum. Um, all you needed to do then was to to write a smart contract, um, and you would have access to this type of technology. A key a key point here is that it's much more efficient than the traditional way of transacting. Um, because you're cutting out the costs of all these middlemen, uh, right, which are really quite enormous costs often. I used to be a lawyer, and uh, I can tell you we, uh, we charge a lot. Um, and so suddenly you had a way of doing this all much more efficiently. Another thing to note is that you're actually creating new markets here, um, that the transaction costs associating with transacting uh, previously made prohibitive. Um, so now, um, uh, if you previously avoided getting into contractual relationships of a certain kind because the cost of hiring third parties, independent third parties who oversee the agreement and its execution was too prohibitive, now there was all these markets that basically emerge out of the reduction in transaction costs that smart contracts represent and provide. But there was a problem. And the problem was that there were still many smart contracts that still need data inputted into them from off chain. Uh, this data might be data from elsewhere on the internet, or it might be data from the real world uh, in some form or other. Um, uh, this, is, this data forms in many, there are many types of smart contracts in which this data forms part of the execution conditions of the contracts. Um, so this data when input is going to be what basically executes the agreement between the two contracting parties. There's a problem there, which is that if the data is wrong, then the contract might execute incorrectly, which is a big, big risk, um, which could be very costly for the parties. Um, so uh, that's the that's the problem that Chainlink is getting at. Um, before Chainlink, there was this sort of, maybe it's not right to say chronologically before, but one of the other sort of solutions that have been touted or used in the interim has been oracles, trusted third party oracles. Um, and so the theory goes that you would, as two parties to a smart contract, you would find or a trusted third party oracle that would feed this data that triggers the execution of the smart contract into the smart contract, right? Um, and that way, you know, because it's a trusted third party Oracle, you, uh, you sort of have some degree of confidence that the smart con that the data will be correct and that the contract will fire correctly. But there's obviously some problems with this. Um, first of all, you've reintroduced a single point of failure. Um, the consequence, so, so what if the Oracle, uh, it turns out, runs away with, with um, you know, what if they provide the wrong data? Um, uh, what if they collude with one of the contracting parties? Um, there's, there's lots of uh, problems with having a single point of failure like this. And the consequences of this can really be quite disastrous when it's two strangers who are transacting over the internet as opposed to two uh, people in real life transacting. Um, in real life, they would know each other, even if they are uh, contracting at arm's length, um, and they would be able to seek recourse to the courts and they would have other options at their disposal. But you don't really have that in the case of smart contracts because the two parties are often anonymous and they may live in different jurisdictions and so on. So what do you do if your smart contract fires with the wrong data? Uh, you, you're really left with no recourse and it becomes an even more costly procedure to try to unwind it. Um, another problem with this is that in trying to select a trusted third party oracle, the parties are both self-interested and thus to that extent they're adverse from one another. Thus how do they come to an agreement about which trusted third party uh, they should select? Um, uh, you know, they each have a, uh, have a self-interested reason for selecting any number of different uh, third-party oracles. And uh, of course, there's then the problem of if one party suggests one, then the other might suspect that there's something dodgy going on. So it introduces a problematic dynamic in trying to select a third-party oracle. Um, 
And also more generally, it's just sort of inconsistent. Trying to choose a trusted third party oracle is inconsistent with the nature of their relationship, which is uh, by implication in the case of smart contracts, more ephemeral and remote, more anonymous, higher velocity. Uh, this is why parties choose to use a smart contract. Or part of the reason why is that they're looking for um, this type of contractual relationship. And if you start making it cumbersome and telling them that they need to go and find another third party oracle, it's introducing an element of uncertainty and inefficiency, which is really inconsistent with, with the things that brought the parties to smart contracts in the first place. So what do you do about all these problems? Well, Chainlink has a solution to them. So what is Chainlink? Chainlink is a decentralized Oracle network. Um, so uh, what you have uh, is a lot of independent Oracles who are collecting data feeds from around the internet. And this data that they're collecting can be all sorts of things. It could be price feeds of different assets. It could be stock tickers. But basically, there are a lot of oracles who are collecting all of this data and compiling it into data feeds and data packets. Um, and what Chainlink does is it runs a series of nodes. And those nodes, anyone can set one up. And those nodes collect these data feeds from the oracles. And they vouch for the accuracy of the data feeds and the data streams. Um, and in vouching for it, they put, they stake link um, so that if they um, are incorrect about the uh, content of the data, if they get, if they report the data stream inaccurately, then they are penalized um, by losing some of that, that uh, link that has been staked on the node. Yeah, Henry, I think I'll just jump in right there. Uh, I think that that was a great explanation. So like one, one thing too, I want to make sure of is, so the, the service contracts of what he was just kind of talking about of like staking links. So that that's in the pipeline. It's not something that's active at the moment. Really what, what is based around is reputation. And so again, I think um, we can go ahead and get started, but I really want to thank Gavin and Henry for organizing this meetup and really want to thank each of you for, for taking the time and joining us today. Really excited. Um, kind of how I was saying at the beginning, I've uh, been to Dublin a few different times, spent a summer out there. So really excited to see the growing tech community there and uh, each of you for joining us. I think before we get started, what's everyone's familiarity with blockchain, chain link, uh, and, and, and that sort of thing? Maybe you can use the reaction button and put like a thumbs up if you're very familiar with, with blockchain. Couple of us. So some of us are just, are we web developers trying to just get a gauge of whoever everyone is. How many of you have heard of, of Chainlink? Let's do the, do, the, do the same thing. A few of us, cool. Okay, perfect. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and share my screen here. And again, uh, Henry, that was, that was a wonderful explanation uh, of kind of the, the, the general problem and everything that we are trying to solve here. So um, can everyone see my screen? Cool. So yeah, Chainlink. So what we do, I, I'm going to try to say this without using like the least amount of buzzwords and try to put this as simply as possible. So smart contracts fundamentally, yes, yeah, smart contracts in the future are going to have so many applications that, you know, we can't even think about these days. And so they have a fundamental problem though. It's impossible to get real world data onto these deterministic contracts um, without using some sort of Oracle. And you can kind of think of an Oracle as in a way, like an API. So you, if you're like a web developer, like how do you get that data onto your platform? Well, for smart contracts, you have to use an Oracle. If you're using a single Oracle, well, that puts you at risk at data manipulation. Uh, there's been a few different hacks in the past where someone, you know, takes out a big loan, goes and manipulates the market, pushes the price up or down. Uh, and then your, your contract, uh, people are getting liquidated, people are losing money, your, your platform's not secure. And so what we do is we have a bunch of preset oracles for, for different price feeds and, and many more that, that are coming out. So to kind of just give like a, a visual view of 
how, how Chainlink works and is live now that you can see. You can always go to feeds.chain.link. And these are, these are oracles or these are different node operators. And this Oracle contract, so you can just plug this into any, any sort of DAP that you're building and be able to see um, what, what the price is. So each of these nodes are pulling data from different data sources. We make sure that none of them are using the same ones. Um, each one, each data source can be used three times by, an, by a node. So a bunch of different data sources. That's why you can see that some of these have different prices. They're very close, but they're all slightly different. So this one, Figment Networks, they're saying the price of Ethereum to USD is uh, $243.72.727. Whether well, something like Kaiko is two hundred forty-three dollars and eighty-four cents. So each of these are getting slightly different different prices, and, and so then this price goes into your contract. Why this is very important is as we saw um, a few months back, when the Ethereum network was very congested, a lot of people were selling. It was just a, a fire sale. Um, some of the exchanges, you know, the, the prices went to basically zero, and so people on those platforms that were maybe getting lent tokens, having tokens staked there, and then getting some in return, uh, ended up getting liquidated and ended up losing a lot of money. So using Chainlink on your platform, you, you can kind of prevent that uh, because we take an aggregated result. So if there is an outlier of one exchange that you know just gets completely liquidated, you're not gonna see that as a result of, of the ultimate contract. Um, a little, little more on the Chainlink site. So if you go here, uh, we have a bunch of different solutions, kind of exactly what uh, Brian was talking about. Uh, so we have, we have, and actually today, uh, we're completely securing over a billion dollars uh, between all the DeFi platforms that are using our product, which is a huge milestone and says a lot about each one of our users. You can see each of our users on the feeds.chain these are all live on mainnet. So synthetics, Aave, between them, it's close to almost, I think, $900 million, which is absolutely incredible. And looking at the growth of DeFi, we're definitely on the path to something. What I want to talk about today, though, um, and if you have questions, um, definitely go down to our website. Uh, I have links in my presentation. Uh, we have a Discord. Patrick's there. He's always able to, to help answer, answer questions if you're a developer and links to all of our social channels. And we have a huge community, huge open source community, and definitely recommend for everyone to, to join. If you have questions, always feel free to reach out to any of us on the team. We're, we're here to be able to help and help and work with you. Uh, before I go further, is there anyone that has any, any questions? And we can keep this open. So if you have a question throughout, like feel free to just stop me and then we can just keep this talking. No questions? Just remember to unmute yourself if you do have a question. Not very basic, but. Yeah, yeah, feel, feel free to, to stop me. Cool, so really what I wanted to, to share with everyone today is to talk about a, a new feature that Chainlink has been working on and, and is starting to gain a lot of traction and it's called Chainlink VRF. So this is going to be a very high level um, just introduction talk to what Chainlink VRF is uh, and how you can integrate it and how different governments, states uh, are integrating it today and what some of the implications of that are completely down the line. So what VRF stands for is verifiable random function. Who here is like a, a web developer or soft, software engineer? Anyone? Anyone code with like JavaScript? Yeah, a few of us. So, so you know like a, a math.random function. So when you're creating, you know, some sort of application online and you want to create a random number, you need a random number generator. So that works, but it doesn't work on smart contracts. So we've created a verifiable way to put this on chain to create a random number generator and to trustlessly uh, create a verifiable random functions. So here, let me present my screen. Randomness in society. So 
if we think about, okay, what, what is all the, the random stuff that we use in our day-to-day -day life? Well, one that, that initially just jumps out at, at everyone, jumps out at us, you know, is national draft lotteries. Let's think about, you know, just any sort of lottery, any sort of gambling. There's wide implications for needing randable, ra random functions uh, for, for each of these. So the system is based on a random selection of birth dates, um, yeah, maybe, maybe it's some sort of, sort of draft for, you know, who knows what, whether it be a war or whether it just be, you know, a lottery, uh, of trying to just pick a random Powerball winner, uh, or I'm not sure what they call it, call it in, in Dublin, but, uh, yeah. And so to create this fair and equitable method of calling, um, uh, men to service. So, so that, that's kind of a, a deep take on something that is a, a draft lottery and why you would need functions. But to go a little bit into like betting, so I'm here in Denver, Colorado. One thing that our government is working on is they're looking to F Denver, Ethereum, Denver, and Web3 for its next lottery games. So instead of having something, you know, that is just spin the wheel, pull a ball out, here you go, this is gonna be the number for the Powerball. That's what we call our, our lottery in the state of Colorado we want to put this onto the blockchain. And so what we're going to need is some way to verifiably randomly prove this. And so Patrick has been working with, with, um, at the Denver and will be a part of a hackathon that's happening next month to help build this new lottery system for the state of Colorado, which is really, really exciting and really shows different use cases for what could be happening and, and why more and more governments are turning towards blockchain because you can create these systems trustlessly. You can make them automated. You don't need to have someone there doing this and you can make it more and more and more automated. Also, Ian Keen, who, who is here in this, there's a good video on the Chainlink community videos who really talks about some of the implications of you know, this, this future reality um, and, and the process of getting there through smart contracts and blockchain and everything that they're working on as well. Other things is randomness in science, uh, clinical trials. So it, especially like right now with like COVID testing, uh, there, there's a lot of different trials happening, but this goes with any sort of drug. Any sort of drug you have to go through in the United States, the FDA, um, I'm sure there's something in, in Ireland if they're trying to create some sort of drug and you have to go through clinical trials. You have to randomize these uh, to ensure the best way that the results are not biased. So really you try to find people that are as close to each other as possible, uh, you know, in physical stature, um, who they are, what, what their diet is, different things. And then you give one person the actual drug and you give one person a sugar pill or some sort of placebo. This needs to be random. You can't bias this at all. Right now we're, we're using, you know, just a random function, but is it actually really random or, or is it not? And so you're putting this onto the blockchain using a smart contract for this, using something like Chainlink VRF to randomly verify that it is random, you know, can automate this process and show that it is actually truly random and not biased, which is very important, uh, especially like we see with COVID, you know, like we want to get a drug out there and, a, and something so we can all go back to the pubs and be able to hang out with friends and do these meetups in person. There's also a lot of randomness within just technology in general, as, as we were talking about before, uh, whether you're just a JavaScript developer or something even more secure like communications, there's a lot of random processes whose consequences, you know, are unknown uh, in randomness is very crucial to cryptographic applications. So even within, you know, creating an Ethereum address, that string of numbers has to be random. So how do you create something that's verifiably random for each one? Uh, well, you can use Chainlink VRF for something like that. The one that we are really focused on at, at Chainlink and where we see a, a huge application for, and I've seen a lot of people implementing this already, is within gaming. So it doesn't matter what, what kind of game that, that you're playing, um, there's, there's a whole lot of different applications for it. And I'll, I'll show a few examples after this slide. Um, but in 2020, um, there's over 2.7 billion gamers throughout the world. 
it's astronomical numbers. I mean, what is there, 9 billion people? So, you know, uh, over close to a quarter, if not more of people are playing, playing games uh, on a daily basis. And they spend $159.3 billion uh, playing these games. Even, I, I don't know how everyone is familiar with Ethereum and its founder Vitalik, but one of the things that he said and was quoted of what really got him on the idea of Ethereum and really wanting to create this was he was playing, uh, I think, World of Warcraft and, you know, his sword was, was taken away and someone scammed him and he's like, I want a way to be able to fix this. And so he started thinking about smart contracts and how he can create this system uh, that, that could possibly prevent this in, in the future. So randomness, you know, it drives results in the games industry through monetization, engagement, retention, uh, and you're going to need to be able to randomly verify this. A few uh, examples, I, I kind of just want to show some of the people that we work with so you can kind of see it live in the action. One is called wild wow cards. And so you can basically buy these cool little cards on with Ethereum. And so they use VRF to randomize the different features of them and to um, be able to have each one be slightly different. And so they've already raised 17.5 F for conservation, which is pretty cool that they, they just launched. And another one that, that we've been working with is called Chain Faces. And so it's kind of similar to, I don't know if everyone is familiar with CryptoKitties, but it's, it's another version of this. And so they implemented Chainlink VRF. They, they launched, it was a very successful launch, but people were ultimately being able to manipulate parts of these data. And so implementing with Chainlink VRF allowed them to do this in a verifiably random way and present that from happening. So this is, this is the quote that, that they had down here. So while Chain Faces launch was largely considered a success, it was not entirely without issues. So more specifically surrounding the on-chain randomness. Some of the faces minted were using special techniques that could abuse the contract random number generator. Luckily, those methods for them, they, they left trails that were easily identifiable. Chain Faces ended up having to go and buy these cards back. And then they kind of went back to the drawing board. This is right around the same time that we were launching Chainlink VRF, so it worked out perfect. Um, so instead, they implemented Chainlink VRF, and now they're able to avoid exposing uh, their, their future users uh, to the unfair and malicious activity that experience in the past. So they're able to create a provably fair and scarcity of a per amount uh, in any way collectible. And so they're one of our, our big users as well with this. Another thing too to kind of just like think about is that perfect randomness is almost impossible to predict. And it's impossible to bias and equal distribution of outcomes. But really what the world is about is a lot of imperfect randomness. So if consider just, you know, like a rugby match or um, a, a football match or whatever it may be, and like determining who, who gets the ball first. You know, there's a lot of times that the head side, you know, lands down more than the tails because it's heavier. Um, so, so coins themselves are not created absolutely perfect. It, it makes sense, you know, all right, there, there's two sides, heads and tails. Uh, but when you actually flip them a hundred times, it might not always land 50-50. Usually like law of large numbers, it ends up equaling out very close to 50-50. To um, but just looking at it, at it in a, a realistic way, something like a coin can be manipulated. Another way is, you know, if you're flipping coins quite a bit, you can get really used to, you know, the distribution and like how you flick the coin and kind of manipulate it slightly in your way. So using a random number generator on a computer, you can actually really create this perfect randomness. And again, with this perfect randomness, what, what, what's important is, you know, whether it be for a draft lottery in, you know, uh, a world war, or whether it be for you know, just choosing a lottery winner to win a million bucks, uh, 
creating this perfect randomness is really where the direction that we are wanting to head in time. So why is randomness hard within smart contracts? Ethereum itself um, is deterministic. So what this means is that participants control the inputs and within these smart contracts, you're telling it what you want it to end up doing. That's what creates this automated path and why people are saying, you know, smart contracts can start to begin to automate things because they, they are deterministic. So randomness is very hard to be able to put into this. And I think um, Patrick can probably step in and kind of talk about this a little as well. Um, so why is randomness hard again in smart contracts? Participants control the inputs. So even though an Ethereum address might look random enough like this, uh, you can kind of put in the background, I want to pick a winner if the last digits just end in 777, uh, whatever it may be. Again, kind of going back to on-chain randomness and the face golf. Uh, so there's a lot of RAM number generating abuse after finding their traction. So some of the faces were manipulated. People were able to go into the code when they were buying these different faces and manipulate them. Well, if this is what your entire platform's on, you know, it, it's, it could end up a big deal. And then, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'll, uh, I'll, I'll jump in a little bit here um to kind of go over a little bit of a little bit more in depth why this is such a this is such a big thing so as as keenan kind of showed in one of the slides before you know if you want to do like some type of lottery or some type of random thing you know you could do something like hey like you know if your address uh ends in 777 you know we'll we'll give you a special prize you know obviously that can be easily manipulated um, because then, you know, what would you do? Okay, well, I'm just going to rip up as many wallets as I can. And instead of like a random winner winning, it's more likely that whoever ripped up the most amount of fake wallets is actually going to be the winner. So the, the, the random system in that case could be abused in that sense. So, um, and it, with, the, with the evolution of kind of how random numbers were generated, the, the next iteration was to, uh, was to think, okay, well, well, let's let's find a let's find a better random number. And uh, what a lot of Solidity developers came up with was um, basing their random number off of the block hash or the timestamp of the block at the moment, um, because because uh, again, like since Ethereum's deterministic, yeah, they they can't come up with a truly random number. They can only come up with a pseudo random number, right? So the thought is, okay, well, the block hash is probably complicated enough. The timestamp is probably complicated enough that that somebody can't actually hack that. I'll, I'll have my random number be off of that. But um, something you have to keep in mind is that any decision that a user makes, which affects the outcome, uh, can give the user unfair advantage. And for example, in the case of the block hash or the, or the timestamp or any other user defined value, um, the miner has a choice actually of whether or not to publish a block. So if they, um, if they mine a block, if they're the first one to mine the block, uh, and then they see, oh, well, I'm not going to be the winner of this of this random prize. Let's say the prize is like a billion dollars, and they really want to win the prize. They can choose to to not mine the block, to not publish the block, and you know keep keep trying to mine again, right? And if they do it again, you know, as many times as they you know mine it, or uh, they have a chance to to win that prize per block that they mine. Um, so it, it does give the miners a, a hugely unfair advantage in that regard and, and all the non-miners would be, you know, shit out of luck for, <laughs> for lack of a better word. But uh, so, so this is where, uh, if, if we want to go back to, uh, yeah, so this is where, um, you know, the, the Chainlink VRF kind of comes in and just adding more to everything that, that Keenan is, is saying. So what you can do, um, so, so the next uh, evolution in, in getting random numbers on chain is, is having an Oracle um, get a random number from, from an API, right? So you could have uh, like a chain link node pulling data from something like random.org, right? So random.org gives a random number, um, posts it on chain. Now this is, this is good, this is better, but there are still issues with this as well, right? If, if random.org gets hacked 
or if the node that you're pulling through um, decides that they want to win still, you know, all they have to do is just change whatever response they got from random.org and post that to the chain. And then, Ken, if you go to the next slide, this is, yeah, this is showing, hey, like the, the, the node operator or the, or the data provider or the random provider, you know, sending this, this not random data. And the other thing is, if they send this not random data um, from like an off-chain, um, from an off-chain process, there's no way to verify that this is a random number, right? There's no way to, for them to say, okay, cool. Like, you know, pretty, pretty much you have to trust that they're giving you a random number, which, you know, that defeats the purpose of blockchain. Um, I use the analogy a lot, you know, like uh, it, it's like buying a bicycle to get to work faster and then continuing to walk to work with the bike strapped to your back, you know, like blockchain and randomness is a solution um, to a problem, the, the problem being centrality. And if you're going to use it in a, in a uh, blockchain in a, in a centralized way, it's, it's in my mind, it's, it's defeating the purpose of using it and, and actually making your life a whole lot harder. So, so, uh, so that's kind of like the next step, but uh, Chainlink VRF, if we, if we go to the next slide here, Chainlink VRF actually can provably say, Hey, you know, here is why this number is random, which is a massive massive milestone because not only are you you're getting an uh an actually random number from off chain that nobody can interact with nobody can tamper but they're proving it and they're saying here's why it's random right which is something something kind of insane and and, and a little bit hard to comprehend but there's some some uh cryptographic magic uh, that basically goes on uh behind the scenes i won't go t into too much detail of it here but uh, it, they're saying hey not only you know, is this number um, is this number coming from an actual random source? But we can prove it, and here's the cryptographic proof as to why it's random. Which is why this is such a like a massive monumental uh, achievement that's happened here. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah. So to kind of just like go kind of run through um, what what we were just kind of talking about and like why this is so massive and so so exciting. You know, we can completely transform the way that governments work way cryptography works, the way that the medical industry works, the way that, that games work, you know, everything from a, a huge spectrum of different use cases, all being able to connect smart chain, smart contracts with randomness. Um, everything from, you know, just a game that you might use on your day-to-day -day life to, you know, some of the biggest decisions that a government could ever have to possibly make. Um, all the way to, you know, saving lives through creating new clinical trials. Um, so it, it's completely massive. It's changing the way that cryptography works um, and flipping it on its head. And we're just seeing we're at the very forefront of, of a whole new greater future. Um, and, and, it, and it's very cool to see. And, and it's exciting. It's exciting seeing different people build on this. And so if you want to help build, um, there's a lot of different benefits uh, of using Chainlink VRF over just other solutions and just pulling a single API. As Patrick was kind of talking about, it's very easy to integrate. Our team is all on Discord that we were willing, wanting to help um, you create your, your new project. Results appear fast and we're working on making these appear even faster because I'm sure that there'll be a question that comes up is, okay, are you able to kind of create these in a way within a game you would think that you're going to need a lot of different calls. So if you're having trouble with just like Ethereum transactions, how's this going to work? Uh, we're working on scaling solutions for this. Um, obviously, like got to figure out how to just get the random number online first. And now that we've accomplished that, um, we're, we're working on being able to scale this, but it, it is in the works. And you can clearly put it on chain to, to verify. What some of our users say, um, Lane Krusk of Pool Together. So incorporating Chainlink VRF benefits Pool Together by providing a more reliable and provably secure form of randomness in the selection of prize winners. So Pool Together, basically it's like a, it's a on-chain lottery system. So people pool their money into this pool and then they randomly choose a winner to win that pool afterwards. Um, and so they use Chainlink VRF to be able to do that. So it's kind of like a semi-public online lottery. Chain faces, we're kind of talking about what they do with face golf um, and, then, and then wild cards. And so like the way that wild cards uses VRF2 is they have a DAO. And so um, I, I believe in Patrick 
may jump in if, if I'm incorrect. So every time at the end of the month, they choose a, a winner of a different wild card of someone that's a part of their DAO. Yeah. So, uh, so they're still integrating it. Um, but that, yeah, that's essentially what they're doing. Cool. Yeah. And so if you have questions, um, you can see the docs on our docs page, um, just docs.chain.link slash docs chain link BRF. Uh, I made a bit.ly link for everyone to jump into our discord and I can share these slides um, with the guys afterwards to, to share with everyone, but just bit.ly slash chain link dash discord. And then uh, our telegram, just chain link official. And if you ever have questions, you'll see me and Patrick both in there. Uh, we're always very active. Don't be shy. Feel free to reach out to us anytime and happy to help you on anything that you're working on. Or if you have questions, uh, we can be there and be able to assist you. Cool. So I'm sure there, there's a lot of questions and happy to kind of kind of jump in. And if anyone has any, uh, we can kind of help help answer those. Thanks, Kim. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, Gavin, Ian Keith here. Apologies, I'm in a play park with my kids. Um, just curious on the Chainlink um, BRF function, do you like to find a, a random set of numbers, like uh, from one to 100? How do you define the, the data set? Uh, is that configurable? I'm just curious how it works. And also, second question, do you need a, a separate set of Chainlink nodes to run BRF, separate to the price needs? So two questions on that. Yeah, so, um, so on the second question, uh, no, you can, you can run a, a Chainlink VRF uh, job in, in your regular Chainlink node. Uh, so it's just like another job. Um, and then what was the first question? Uh, do you define the, the data set? So like, for example, do you just say, I want a random number between one and a thousand, like integers, or a random a real number between one and zero, or is it like alpha? How do you define the data set which you pull a random number from? Yeah, so it basically gives you a random hash, right? And then if you want to, um, or like a like a basically, you can think of it as just like a super random, like massively big number. And then if you want to get, you know, uh, if you want to like roll the dice, for example, like a six sided die, you just use like a mod function. So you do like the random number of mod six, and then you get like a random number between one and six. Yes. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Good question. Cool, thank you. I love how we can ask those questions in the park now, which is even better. Um, anybody else have any questions for the guys? Maybe even like not even VRF related, but if you have questions about Chainlink, um, any questions, feel free to. I, I have a question ask. about um, something like um, band protocol. So that's like another kind of decentralized Oracle project. Um, and I was just wondering like when, in what way would that impact maybe like chain links, um, like usage throughout like the, the blockchain ecosystem or even like the, like, what would you say their their share of the market cap or whatever, just from a, an investor's perspective, or I know like chain link doesn't seem to be something that's very, uh, or the team doesn't seem to be very worried about how much they're, uh, link costs, but for people like me who are kind of on the sidelines, uh, would you have much of an insight into that? Yeah, so I mean, I, I can't speak on anything about price. Uh, again, the kind of like what you said, don't don't really, we don't really think about that. Um, one thing to really keep in mind is within Band itself, they don't even have Oracle functionality yet. So. <laughs> They don't have any users that are using it in the ways that we explained of being able to use an Oracle. And so that that's like the, the major thing. Um, it, it's more of a blockchain. I think those questions would probably be best in, in band, um, like a band meetup or telegram. Uh, but that, that's one thing to kind of kind of be aware of. There's a lot of people within the community that will kind of be able to help answer that chain like God obviously has like a lot of, a lot of different threads. But one of the things that, that we really focus on and work for is what you see if you go to like our chain link YouTube and a lot of the different teams that are integrating with us, very easy to integrate um, our customer support and being able to work with each of these teams um, hands on and be able to integrate it, you know, within just a couple different days. That's nothing that any other Oracle service can be able to say. Uh, it, you know, we see it with synthetics, they need a new feed because people are asking for a 
new market, they can come and be able to uh, come to us and we'll be able to find that data and be able to put it onto their, their network very quickly uh, and, and so forth. So yeah, if you have other questions, happy to answer them privately. Hopefully, hopefully that helped a little bit. One of the things I found quite interesting was the gaming side of it. Um, is, is, you know, gaming has exploded in the last you know, four months with COVID. Has there been a bigger uptake from gaming companies around, you know, that side of how they're, how they're kind of managing their privacy and obviously wallets and different things as it goes forward? Yeah, so I, th there is a lot of different different companies that are looking at it. So I, I know personally, like the, the founder of, of Zynga Games, uh, he, he started at one, it's called Blockchain Gaming Network, I believe. And so he, he's the creator of Farmville. And so he's like basically trying to recreate that on Ethereum and using the blockchain. So with all this, you're gonna need random functions. Um, there's a lot of different people that uh, within like the gaming industry that, you know, they really see as gaming as like the next, next big step within blockchain uh, and that, you know, there's a lot of applications. I think the one thing that's slowing it down a little bit right now is just network speed and being able to create these very quickly and on chain. Uh, but but soon as some of these scaling stuff get get solved, you know, I, I think blockchain gaming is gonna gonna explode very quickly. Anybody else could ask a couple of questions for the guys? Yeah, yeah. I have one there. Hi yeah. guys. Uh, great chat. <clears throat> Obviously, uh, Chainlink and, and crypto are in very early days, and um, yes, gaming would be a huge, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, opportunity. But <clears throat> what about more uh, mainstream uh, avenues like what Brian mentioned earlier in the chat, like law, uh, medical, um, you know, it, It'd be great to see uh, inroads into those uh, types of areas. Did yeah, so that? yeah, there, there's quite a few, and you know, like what was really like kind of slowing down a lot of these, like, and so we, it was kind of on a different presentation, but it was kind of similar to what Brian was talking about at the beginning is like there's this been this progression, you know, if we really like look back on like zoom out, blockchain cryptocurrency smart contracts these things have been around for you know about 20 20 years maybe a little before that cryptography and started in like the 1940s and so it, it's really kind of progressing and it's starting to exponentially progress right now you know with, with bitcoin it went with this programmable peer-to-peer -peer money and then it led into these smart contracts that you know next was like a kind of smart contract platform Ethereum took that to a whole different level and really kind of created these programmable contracts that people were able to create tokens for. And then we saw this whole ICO boom that happened in 2015 through 2017, where people were just tokenizing anything and forking code and creating this. And what they're really missing was a way to be able to make those tokens and these contracts useful. And that's really why you're seeing, and even that previous question of, you know, there, there's is competition and competition is a great thing because it, it's what's making these contracts on Ethereum so valuable. Now you're able to put real life data and put it on chain, which is something that, you know, was not possible in 2017, it, barely possible in 2018 and has just over the past year become extremely possible and now very applicable. And so we see different things with uh, DeFi money markets, one that's taking, you know, different like car loans and putting them on chain. We got stuff um, like synthetics, which is basically being able to create markets out of, you know, everyday markets and be able to put them on chain, whether it be like the price of gold, price of silver, um, they're integrating some other new futures in, in the future. Uh, and so you're seeing a lot more really applicable and real ones, uh, real life applications come to life. There's other, other countries that are really kind of taking this to the next step as well. Uh, in South Korea, there's a project called Clayton and they, they are working within like the South Korean 
health department for exactly that, putting medical records on the blockchain. And they work very closely with the South, South Korean government uh, to, to be able to do this. And so they use Chainlink oracles to do that. And uh, if you, I think if you just type in Clayton and Chainlink, I'm sure it'll come up the blog about that um, oh, as, as private. Uh, that that will come up for you. I can send that blog over to Gavin and maybe he can share it with everyone in the email afterwards. But yeah, so, you know, it's a progression. So th things are moving along and, you know, within who knows where we'll be in six months and in a year. But now that more and more people are able to use oracles to be able to put useful data on chain, uh, there's going to be a lot more applications that, that will come to life. And, and is that where you see the kind of evolution of this going with, you know, with, with kind of, not the crypto side of it, but the, the chain side of it, would that be the, the kind of smart contracts being, being the, the major functionality or what, what, what would you see the kind of the evolution of this? Yeah, uh, I mean, what, what do you think, Patrick? Sorry, you cut out a little bit there. I missed the question. I was just saying, like, what, what would be the kind of evolution of, of what's going on now? Is the smart contracts kind of where, where the, not where the money is, but where it kind of next steps of this is, or, or where do you see it? In, in terms of Chainlink VRF or just smart contracts in general? In, in general, yeah, in general kind of areas. Wow. Uh, you, could, you could get me Predict ranting the future, here. Go on. <laughs> what, what was that? Predict the future for us. Come on. Well, I hear, I'm, I'm going to do one better. I'm going to, we got a special guest that's here today, uh, two special guests, Charles, Annie, and Keen. Uh, and they, they hosted an amazing AMA together that really answers this question and highly, highly recommend watching this video that I just dropped in the chat because it really talks about, you know, what this future looks like being able to involve um, a world that's powered by, you know, IoT. AI, blockchain, and kind of how they all intertwine together. And I don't know, maybe Ian, if you want to want to. Yeah, jump I'll jump in line. here. I mean, the question is what's selling today with blockchain smart contracts and it's finance and supply chain are the two use cases we see right now. Um, so finance for settlements, so cross-border payments, or just, just to prove that you paid something. And also if you want to just Google uh, Circular and Oracle, we have a startup, just a two, three-man band, who's able to verify um, materials from Africa. I think it's lithium for lithium batteries to the Volvo factory. So when Volvo receive a lithium uh, battery to put in their hybrid cars, they know that there was um, all the environmental laws were abided by. There was no child labor, all that type of thing. So that's one example of, of supply chain and, and finance. And to that end, you know, that's where Chainlink potentially could make that tenfold because you can now bring in external data and bring a lot more functionality to that. Uh, right now, it, it's very specific in terms of what we can do with blockchain. Um, but, you know, a year, two years from time now, I think it'll, it'll be the industry in terms of what we can do. It will be 10 times more than what we can do today, potentially even more. So hope that answers. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Ian. But yeah, definitely recommend uh, checking out that blog I dropped into the, the Zoom chat and then also this video. Um. Okay, so is anybody, anybody else, any questions to finish? Going once. One thing too, uh, just because I see Shane's comment in this chat, uh, Chainlink is hiring, so definitely uh, check out our website. If you just go to uh, careers.smartcontract.com, um, if you're a web developer or anything else, definitely um, apply. Uh, if you want a recommendation, um, feel free to chat with me and we, we can talk as well. I'll draw, I'll draw that up on the, on the email afterwards as well. Um, and anybody else just before we finish up? Just one other, uh, one other comment there as well for, uh, for Shane. Uh, I would definitely recommend jumping to the Chainlink Discord um, and chatting about, uh, about some of your skills there. And also, um, there is a, uh, there's a hackathon going on right now. There's hackathons happening all the time. Uh, they're great places to you know, show some skills. 
uh, meet some people. I just posted the link to uh, the Unitize Hackathon in there. Win some prizes, show off your skills, and uh, and get seen. So definitely check out uh, hackathons as well. All right, Brill. Uh, guys, Patrick, uh, Keenan, Brian, thanks, Mill, for your time today. It was a really, really interesting uh, conversation. The, the time flew away there in an hour. So um, thanks for your time. Thanks, everybody, turning up. I'll post the video. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I've tagged the guys in the Dublin Tech Talk uh, LinkedIn group. So reach out to them on LinkedIn, and I'm sure they'll, they'll come back to you. But thanks, Mill, and everybody in your evening. Well, thank, thank you all. I really Thanks, appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Thank you. I really appreciate it.